He was born in the Central Valley, uh, and his family were, uh, had, had you know, produced milk, and at age six, he decided to leave the water and get out on an aluminum dinghy, which he'll show you a little bit later on. He became an avid water skier, and avid means you're willing to water ski in the sloughs of San Francisco Delta, which is a wonderful kind of a thing. Uh, he went on to great uh, things, as we all know, uh, graduated from Chico State, doing graduate work at Harvard, and uh, becoming the chairman of the California Coastal Commission uh, in 1996, becoming the director of the California State Parks in uh, 1999, and founding California Strategies, a very savvy political strategy group in the state of California. And uh, he is responsible for not only just one uh, Stevens, but he's actually got an interest in three. And you know, the, uh, the everybody knows the definition of a boat it is a hole in the water into which you pour money and less. And I know this story because I own an 85-year-old 1937 IOD. It's it's a hole in the wa water into which you pour money unless it's a wind boat where there's active suction. <laughs> and so nobody can talk more about that than the owner of this 102 and Joie V. Uh, come on up, Rusty. Come on up, buddy. Rusty Arias, our speaker today. Welcome, Rusty. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Thank you very much, Ron. You know, at these, uh, these gatherings and, and, and talking to and listening to Stephen's owners and stores, stories about their boats, I always learn new things and get new material. Um, as an example, I didn't know that the doctor who owned the boat delivered one of the Stephen's kids. I didn't know that our Commodore Pete Gilmore was conceived on sea breeze. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. That's how rumors get started. <laughs> anyway, I want to uh, first thank the members of St. Francis Yacht Club for honoring me and, and uh, all the Stevens aficionados, the Stevens family, um, with uh, uh, this presentation. And this lunch, I want to thank Ron Young, who has coordinated this for, for many years. I want to thank the Stevens owners, who many of them uh, took time out of their busy schedules on short notice to bring their boats here for your pleasure. And I hope you'll all take time, um, and you're wearing rubber-soled shoes or take your shoes off when you go, um, when you go on to those, those uh, remarkable crafts. And, uh, and then also the CYA, Classic Yacht Association, and all participating guests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you truly honor not only the Stevens family, and it's fabulous that, that uh, uh, Theo and Bear and, and Dick's descendants are, are here amongst us, all, all, all represented. But you honor the hands. I didn't get the memo. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, you, you honor the hands of the workers, the artisans who produced these fabulous crafts. Um, any of us that have spent time at the Hagen, Hagen Museum, we go there and someone with white gloves, a curator, pulls the file when you give them the whole number, and you sit there and you go through the history of your boat. All of us that are Stephen owners have experienced that. Some of you that are friends have accompanied Stephen owners. And it's like, it's like an archeological deep dive. It's like 23 and me all wrapped into one. <laughs> You know, you learn things about your vessel that you didn't know, whether it's disputes over money, or disputes over design, or disputes over timing. It's all there, handwritten or, or on, a, on a typewriter. But uh, it's part of, of the romance of going to the Hagen Museum. And any of you that haven't been there, go, because it's more than just about Stevens. They have all the archives of Caterpillar there, they have fabulous uh, representations of Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Hill. It's a great little museum that you never hear much about in the Bay Area. 
And uh, with all due respects uh, to your profession, Carl, it would have to burn down to be mentioned in the uh, San Francisco papers. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's a great experience, and I'd encourage you to go there. This, uh, the picture in front of you, this is um, my boat, Miss 102. Uh, and I apologize in advance if there are too many pictures of my boats. I never get tired of looking at them, <laughs> and I hope you won't either. But um, Dick Stevens and his family uh, gave, gave us this, um, this model, which is in the Hagen, Hagen Museum of Miss 102. And I'll get into her history a little later. And she's on the docks out here, so I hope you'll, you'll, uh, you'll come around and, and, and tour. To really understand the Stevens history and the Stevens family and everything that was going on uh, in Central California at that time, uh, you, you've got to really go back to Stockton in about 1850, right around the, uh, the gold rush. And at that time, a sloop called the Mary Mason was the first boat to slide down the banks of the Delta and, and into the waters. And that began the commerce. And it, it began Stockton. It was the start of Stockton be, be, becoming a great building, building center to build these, these fabulous vessels in the Delta region. Because commerce was becoming important. And there weren't bridges. And there weren't telephones. And there, and there weren't roads. And so they depended on, on, on their waterways for, for transportation. And a man named Stephen Davis got a contract to build Siberian steamers. And he was really kind of the founder of the Stockton boat building industry. After Mr. Davis died in 1886, uh, numerous companies had sprung up at that particular time. And they built dredges, and they built tugs, and they built freighters, and they built paddle wheels, and they even built houseboats at that particular time. And this, this picture is in the Stockton estuary. And two of the Stephen brothers' first boat, Gee Whiz on the, on, on the right and Queen on the left, are represented there. In about 1900, uh, the, Stevens, the Stevens sons, who had moved to Yosemite Street in Stockton, um, they were 18 and 20 years old, respectively, uh, Theo and Roy Stevens. And there have been numerous attempts to build boats. And their uncle, Cy Maureen, had been in the transportation business, in the boating business, and uh, the, their family were farmers in the Linden area. But they were living in Stockton on the waterfront. And their first successful attempt at building a boat was Dorothy. The 33-foot sloop you see on the left side, my left side, of, 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 of this picture. And um, uh, it, was a, it was a handsome craft. And they took it out as young men out the Golden Gate and all the way down to, to Santa Cruz. Word quickly got around about these young boat builders and their talents. And they got their first commercial contract, $1,000 down. And they built G Wiz for a, for a local businessman. And uh, there's G Wiz on the right hand side as they're, they're sliding it down. They were building all these boats in their backyard on Yosemite Street. And the neighbors were getting concerned. They were out there working late at night. And it was kind of a mess as a boat yard can be. And about that time, uh, one of the local duck clubs hired uh, both Theo and Roy to build them a 50 foot motor launch. And uh, that was their, their third boat. So they built a sailboat and, and two power boats in their, in, in their first three, three efforts. Charles? This is, this is Beaver, a river tug that they built just about, about that same time. Uh, their fame and, and um, reputation grew very rapidly. Move along. This is the Kohlberg Transportation Company. All Stevens boats, all boats that were contracted by Stevens in, in, uh, in downtown Stockton. It kind of looks a little like Venice. Uh, this was uh, a Curtis seaplane. And this gives you an idea of the talents of the people that they had put together at, 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 at Stevens Brothers. Um, uh, Mr. Curtis was having trouble with his seaplane, so he brought it 
to the Stevens brothers to help him iron out, out the problems. One of the big advantages that Stevens brothers had was right next to them was an ironworks, the Samson uh, Gasoline Engine Company. And Samson employed numerous engineers, and, and this really changed um, the way boats were powered uh, throughout the, the, the Delta. Because up until that time, they were all steamers and wind powered. And to be able to adapt to gasoline engines really uh, allowed the company to grow rapidly. And with Samson right next door to them at the Stevens Yard, uh, they were able to tap into the engineering expertise. This is the George Shima. As, as you know, Stockton and the Delta was a big agricultural area. George Shima was the potato king. And um, the helm of the George Shima, the, uh, the, the pilot house, was the, um, was the office for the Maritime Academy. And uh, Darlene Plumtree uh, and Carl Nolte are here. And that was Darlene's office for a long, long, long time. Um, the neighbors began getting very restless um, and upset, and so the Stevenses, they bought a barge, and they put it out on the Delta, and that became their first shipyard. And then a few years later, in 1920, when they outgrew the barge, uh, they, 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 they built the shipyard uh, that, that is now a five-star marine. Uh, in Stockton on the Stockton waterfront, and this was the, the beginnings of it. Um, Stevens always had a unique ability to adapt. That was one of their great secrets, secrets to success. And as I go through this program, um, you will see that they reinvented themselves depending on market conditions many, many times. So envision the Delta, you know, the, the, the dewatering of the, of the Delta, uh, reclaiming all that agricultural land. And there were farmers out there that were growing all kinds of produce, and there were no bridges or telephones to communicate with them. So whoever had the fastest boat, and they called these merchant or spud boats, um, whoever had the fastest boat was advantaged when they would take their orders and go out and meet with the, the farmers. And to bring attention to just how fast their boat was, they set a record for the fastest trip in, uh, in 1911 from Stockton to San Francisco on the Fred F. Lamborn. That got them a lot of, a lot of publicity. And um, uh, as a result of that, they were able to sell a lot of these, these spud boats. The um, Depression was actually very good for the Stevens brothers. And there was a number of, of reasons for that. Charles, move to the next one. Um, they built a lot of boats like, like this one. Uh, they, they began building cruisers. Um, they, they started building runabouts. Uh, this family is on their way to, to Lake Tahoe. Um, this boat, which is very similar to the one in the Hagen, Hagen Museum, they built uh, a boat called Oski for the um, UC Berkeley rowing team. Uh, this is a boat called Conquest in 1929. So they started building very, very nice uh, cruisers. And it's largely because uh, the spud boat business had kind of, had, had, had kind of come to an end because um, uh, you had roads and bridges and telephones. And as a result of that, there was no longer a need for merchants on fast boats to race out to the farmers. So they reinvented themselves and they started making um, Ma making cruisers. Via Mita is in Hawaii uh, at the Honolulu Yacht Club. Uh, it, it got a lot of publicity years ago and uh, went through numerous hands, but she's restored and she can be chartered on Honolulu Bay. Um, this is Folly 2. You're going to see and hear a lot about Folly 2. Uh, this is a boat that, uh, that I chased for 10 years and uh, I think Bruce mentioned earlier uh, Ted Collins and um, uh, Bruce Jones and John Perkins uh, and I all got together and bought Folly and restored her. Uh, 
this, this boat was ordered originally by Johnny Joseph Marino, a notorious rum runner. And in 1934, he was indicted with 11 San Luis Obispo County ranchers who were allowing him to pull up on their piers, and uh, I'm sure for a price, um, and uh, they were offloading hooch, rum, and other alcohols for delivery into San Francisco, Santa Barbara, San Diego, and, and all points beyond. Go back to, uh, go back one. You notice that they're flying the St. Francis, um, go back to the, Sinister picture. There's flying the San, the, the Saint Francis Burgundy. Now Johnny Joseph Marino, <laughs> Johnny Joseph Marino was not a member of Saint Francis. In fact, he was indicted. But after Prohibition, <laughs> he sold he sold the boat to Beryl Buck of the Buck Center and Buck Family Trust in Marin County, and uh, she owned it for seven years. It was drafted into World War II. She's on the front of the boat. Keep going, Charles. That's the interior of her, and uh, when you board her today to see her, you will, you will see that interior is largely intact. That's her when we were bringing her in for restoration. We found her down in, well, I'd been watching her for about 10 years down in Monterey. A guy named Sam Garrett bought her, but uh, she was coming in to, to begin restoration, and this is her on Dick Stevens' 100th birthday, uh, Dick Stevens' day in Stockton, and that's Dick on the front. Uh, sadly, he died a year later. Um, and then that's May Willow. Uh, the reason that, that um, Stevens did well during the Depression was they began to uh, develop the East Coast market. And May Willow uh, was at the New York Boat Show. And they got a whole slug of orders as a result of that, where she uh, stole the show as a commuter boat for a businessman. St. Francis Burgi again. There you, go. there you go. Well, the Stevens family were a big part of, of St. Francis and competed in, in, in many, many of the races. Then they began building, building uh, various uh, sloops, and uh, Jada was one, Pajara was, was another. Uh, the Farallon Clipper came along not too long after that. I think they made six, a half dozen Farallon Clippers to uh, to start with. That boat was was uh, very popular, and there's a Farallon Clipper um, represented on the docks today. And uh, there's Seabreeze. Seabreeze is with us today. This is a fabulous little boat. David Cobb, thank you very much for taking such good 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 care of her. Seabreeze. Dave will tell you the story, but. She, she was a part of World War II, like Folly. And uh, when she went into the Navy, uh, a general got a hold of her, and this particular general loved ice cream. So she has a compartment built into her just so he could, he could store his ice cream under lock and key. <laughs> 1941, Stevens goes to war. And this was the time period when Stevens built more, more boats than any other. Not pleasure craft, um, as much as um, uh, boats for the war effort. And the Stevens family and Stevens company helped us win four wars. World War I, World War II, um, the uh, Korean War, and, uh, and, and, and the Vietnam War. They were involved in, in military contracting in, in all of them. This is one of the largest boats they ever built, 136-foot minesweeper, uh, in, in 1941. And, you know, they, they were contacted early on because people in, in, in Washington and in the military knew that war was inevitable. And um, uh, so they were contacted and began making arrangements. This is a picket boat. These boats were used as, um, as launches. They were used as small tenders and they were used as patrol boats, and they built a lot of them. This is a salvage boat. Um, I think they built 50 of these salvage boats during, uh, during World War II. This is a tug. And this boat, which looks like a, um, a, a sedan that a family would have, what they would do is when the military came in, they took all the boats that were under contract and just claimed them and just said, you know, sorry, but this is your contribution to the war effort. And they painted them gray and gave them a number 
and uh, you know they returned them in some cases after the war to uh, to their rightful owners. They had a big business on rescue boats, and these look like PT boats, but uh, they built a lot of these, and they were really fast. They'd go 37 hour, uh, miles an hour. The smaller one in the prior picture had a sick bay for up to uh, six injured uh, soldiers, uh, uh, people, and uh, they, they, they had a, a range of about 500 miles. And they probably made a hundred of these rescue boats. Um, that's Folly again, uh, the boat that, that uh, Jonathan and Ted and Bruce and I restored. Folly, of course, is down here on the docks. Uh, Admiral Nimitz is launched in World War II. She um, uh, uh, was called to and given two days to get to Sausalito. Barrel Buck owned her. They painted her gray and uh, renamed her YP-144, Yard Patrol 144, and that's the name of our LLC, YP-144. Um, after the war, uh, Barrel Buck got her back and sold her to her neighbor in Santa Rosa, uh, Ken Bechtel, Warren Bechtel's son. So the Bechtel family owned her for seven years and it was no longer necessary for her to be varnished. You know, this, this is a double plank teak hull on this boat. Double plank teak hull. Most of them are mahogany on oak frames, double plank teak hull. And you know, in the old days, when she first came out of, of Stephen's boatyard, she was all varnished, the whole hull was varnished. And the suspicion was it was because Johnny Joseph Marino wanted to go undetected at night and be able to outrun uh, with his Hall and Scott engines that that uh, that burn 60 gallons an hour, the authorities it would do 22 <laughs> knots. So when 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 Ken Bechtel got her, the Bechtel family got her. Uh, they painted her white in the more traditional way. Um, after the war, uh, Theo Stevens had 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 passed away in 1933. Roy Stevens had been running it, and it was time to turn it over to the next generation. And this is Theo and Bear and Dick Stevens uh, when they were starting out, when they were taking over the, over the reins of Stevens Brothers. This is a name that may be familiar with any, any of you that um, spent any time in Monterey Bay. Uh, this is a boat called Sea St Stag that was built by Stevens Brothers. It could haul up to 36 people for tours around Monterey Bay, powered by Hall and Scott engines again. Um, and you know this boat lives on. It was in Sacramento for a long time, and now it's in upstate New York for sale. If any of you are interested, she's 36 feet, 36 feet, and uh, she's uh, living in upstate New York. This is during the Korean War. Uh, Stevens Brothers again was involved in the war effort, and they came up with the innovation of being able to remove. The, the, the motors of the boat from the bottom of the hull instead of having to cut it out from the top. And this saved all kinds of time. It was an important innovation that, uh, uh, that happened at Stevens Brothers. Um, when the war was over, they had all kinds of material uh, that they had bought for their contracting. And uh, uh, they began again to build pleasure craft. The boat at the top is called Amelia Marie. She was one of three boats that Ted Bricks from Stockton, who Dick, Dick Stevens described as a dilettante with great taste and a wallet to match. Um, he had an organ installed on this boat. And unlike other boats, you know, Chris Crafts and others that, that, that tended to be more mass produced, these boats were built for you know whatever the owner the owner wanted, uh, I owned a boat called Contessa. It was the first Stevens that I bought. You'll see her later. She had a picnic box on the front deck, in between the two hatches. And I asked Dick Stevens one day. I said, "I've never seen a, a picnic box like this again." He said, "But that's because it's the only one we ever built." I said, "Well, why'd you why'd you build it? This is great. Why didn't you build more?" He said, "It was because the owner wanted it." Another owner never asked for one. <laughs> so that was Amelia Marie. You're going you're gonna to hear a lot more about Amelia Marie and a boat called Joie that, that has caused me great pain. Um, that uh, uh, was, a, was the last boat that, that, that Ted Bricks owned. Uh, they also built houseboats. And with all respect to the Stevens family, 
You know, it wasn't their greatest design. <laughs> but I will tell you, they are so well built that they will outlive all of us. Uh, and you see them still around, around the Delta. They were the first aluminum boats that, that the Stevens uh, built. And this is the first sailboat, aluminum sailboat, that, um, that they built. This is Alpha. And I think there's a model of Alpha here in the, uh, yes, in the hallway. In the hallway. And the boat's on the dock outside. You can get over Right, and Alpha is on the dock. So if you don't want to see the model, you can go look at the, at the real thing. That was a, back up a minute, Charles. That was the, uh, the, the first sailboat. And, and this was at a time when um, fiberglass was taking over. And the wood boat owners, I think, just thinking back, were, were probably so sanctimonious about wood that Stevens was afraid they would lose all their customers if they went to fiberglass. I think, you know, one famous um, uh, marine architect um, called fiberglass uh, akin to frozen snot. Uh, he hated it so much. And so instead of going to fiberglass, they went to aluminum. And they didn't know a lot about aluminum, so they went to Sparkman and Stevens on the East Coast, and this was a joint venture that, uh, that they put together, and it was their uh, first aluminum sailing effort. This was a minesweeper that they were, uh, they were building 144 feet. This is a junior clipper. Um, this was a small uh, version. Uh, they built a lot of them with materials left over from the war, and it was not a successful effort for, um, for Stevens. That's me. That's my first boat ride. <laughs> with my godfather and Uncle Jim. Uh, it was the 1955 or 56 flood in the Central Valley. And uh, my uncle had been run out of his house by the, uh, by the rising waters. And uh, we had to go in and lift the refrigerator up on sawhorses to keep it from getting damaged. And uh, it's a new addition to this presentation. My, uh, my, um, uh, my, my godfather's uh, uh, wife gave it to me and I thought I'd add it to the presentation. My first boat ride. That's me up front. Love at first sight. Sea witch. This is the first Stevens boat I'd ever seen. My buddy Tom Wiseman, who I've been uh, water skiing with for 20, 22 years now, uh, we ski 160 or 70 mornings a year. We were out on the Delta one day and we saw this boat coming at us. And I had looked at a Chris Craft earlier that was on the dock and it kind of got me interested in Stevens boats and I saw this boat and I couldn't believe the lines on it. And I started asking around a little bit and that led me to uh, the Hagen Museum. Keep going. While I was at the Hagen, uh, learning about Stevens, I saw this drawing. Um, and this is a boat called Westlake. Uh, it, uh, it flew the St. Francis Yacht Club. Birchie Henry Dolger uh, was a member here. And you can see her in the background. I saw that drawing and I saw that picture of her way in the back. She was the largest built, boat built on the West Coast that year. 85 feet, the first boat with a television and a washer dryer on it. And this boat was just a feast for my eyes. And I began, I embarked on a nine month effort to find this boat. I was gonna get a group of people together and bring it back to the Delta and restore it. Um, with the help of the National um, Commodore, the Commodore of the uh, National Historic Fleet, uh, I, I found her, he called me and he said, um, I, uh, she disappeared off the radar screen in 1992, and, uh, back up Charles, she d disappeared off the radar screen in 1992, and the last owner was Weldon Poole in Covington, Louisiana. So I just picked up the phone and called Covington, Louisiana information, Weldon Poole. I got two numbers, left messages at both, and the next day a very nice little southern lady, uh, she was Weldon Poole's widow, called and said, call Rusty Burns, he knows all about the boat. 
And uh, I found her on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. I called Rusty and she had burned out on her shakeout cruise. They restored her and you'll see in the pictures they totally screwed her up. <laughs> but at that time everybody wanted, you know, they, you know, they wanted white boats so they wanted this or that. But, you know, to me she had everything. And so I was very disappointed. Um, keep going. Henry Dolger bought her, for, had her built for $200,000. Uh, there were 500 people at Stevens Brothers in 1951 when she was, when she was splashed. And um, uh, they had uh, uh, E.C. Robinson, the mayor of San Francisco, was in Stockton with, with Mr. Dolger. And, and he was known for Dolger Homes. Dolger Homes were two bedrooms, a uh, bathroom above the garage, and he built communities like Westlake. And he built about 16,000 of these homes. They, were, they never gained the reputation of an Eichler, but um, they inspired the song Little Boxes on the Hillside by Malvina Reynolds. So anyway, this is Weldon Pool. And if you see the mechanism, see the mechanism on the front of the boat uh, that um, opens the windshield of the, of the porthouse, see that mechanism? So I went down to Madison, Louisiana when the 49ers were in the Super Bowl against Baltimore. And I spent a half a day with uh, Leon Fairburner. And um, he gave me that piece, and I have it here. You wanna? You want to hold it up? Sutton? That's the late, last remaining stretch of, uh, that's the last remaining part of, of, uh, of Westlake. That's all that's, that's left. And we've talked about a Stevens Museum someday and, and that will go in it. And that's Weldon Poole who originally bought the boat. And like a lot of people, you know, what you find is somebody sees a Stevens and they'll follow it for years. I followed Folly for 10 years before we were able to put it together. He first saw, um, as, as I understand it, he first saw Westlake in the early 1950s and followed it and, and finally bought it in the 70s. Uh, it had been a, a charter boat and lots of other things. Keep going. Uh, Miss Budweiser was, was another boat. Oh, no, 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 excuse me. This is Westlake. Looks like Miss Budweiser. So this is her restored, which I don't think is nearly as nice as the original boat. And on her shakeout cruise with 2,400 gallons of fuel on board, that's what happened to her. She's in 2,400 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's Leon Fairburner, who I spent time with. He was the engineer on the boat that day. And they, they, darn, near, um, they darn near drowned. They spent four hours in a lifeboat. And, uh, and barely got away. Anyway, uh, George Amanko, who many of you know, owns a boat named Catherine. He told me, he said, you know, I know you're disappointed about Westlake, but he said, there's a boat that looks very similar to it. It's a little smaller. So we, sh we um, um, uh, photoshopped this, obviously. And that's Westlake at Stevens Yard up front. And this is Miss 102. Miss 102, 60 feet, Westlake was 85. But you can see the similarities. And so I, I went down and began negotiating on, on Miss 102 and, and bought her a couple years later. And that was, that was my first boat, first Stevens boat. This is Ahalani, uh, the sister to Miss 102. This is interesting because Miss 102 um, was Ahalani before Ahalani was Ahalani. And let me tell you what happened. Um, a, na a man named uh, Manuel Serpa, he did all the land leveling for the Tur Tur Turlock Irrigation District, a uh, Portuguese dairy farmer, successful businessman. I actually knew his sons. We showed in 4-H and FFA and those things we do out in the Central Valley together, but I didn't know that they were involved with Stevens boats. He ordered this boat, and, and to get more incestuous, he owned Folly at the time. So after... Um, Ken Bechtel, after seven years, sold Folly. He sold her to Clessy Cummins, who took out the Hall and Scott invaders and put in his own N21 six-cylinder diesels. And he owned her for seven years. Then he sold her to Manuel Serpa. Manuel Serpa owned her for six or seven years. And then he ordered 
uh, Ahalani. And there's a sideboard that goes back to the transom. And he wanted that to be one solid piece of wood. And there was a seam, and we call it the fatal seam. And it was on, it's still on Miss 102. And he rejected the boat for that reason. And when you brought that up to Dick Stevens, his temperature still went up 30 degrees. <laughs> so they were going to have to do so much work to change that that they said, look, this is such a beautiful boat, we'll send it to Southern California to be our showboat, and uh, we'll make you a new one. So that's why Ahalani is a 1958, and, uh, and Miss 102 is a 1956. This is, this is Ahalani, but they're, they're, they're nearly identical. Um, that's Miss 102 up front. I remember I, was, I thought it looked pretty good with a blue stripe, and I asked Dick Stevens one day, I said, you know, I think it looks pretty good with a blue stripe, and he said, blue is for Chris Craft. Red is for Stevens, so anyway, that, that ended that. We were, back up, back up a second, uh, Charles. So that's Contessa on the left, a 1957 uh, gas engine boat. And I was a little nervous about gas engines at that time. And uh, my friend Bob Sloby, go to the next slide, on the left, he liked Contessa better, I liked Miss 102 better. We made a deal for Miss 102 in our offices in Sacramento. He went on eBay that night and, and put a bid in on uh, Contessa and called me the next morning and uh, said, uh, you won't believe what happened last night. I put a bid in and we own a second boat. I said, we? I said, our wives don't know about the first boat, much less about the second boat. And his wife's a federal judge who could have us thrown, both thrown in jail. So, anyway, and uh, you know, we've used the boat for entertaining and um, that's me next to Bob and uh, my cousin and, and uh, former captain of the Angel Island Ferry and the guy in the green shirt, I can't remember, sweater, I can't, I can't remember his name, but anyway. And we've used the boats for entertaining and lots of, lots of political activities. That's, that's Miss 102 and my Republican captain, Steve <laughs> Mansard, who many of you know. All the water buffaloes in the Central Valley. And then this was America's Cup where we spent a lot of time right here at St. Francis Yacht Club. And uh, the second to the last day, I was calling people, couldn't get anybody to come with me. And then uh, they, America won, and my phone just started smoking. We had 33 people the next day. At that time, it was the most people we'd ever had, had on the boat. Miss 102, I told you you'd get tired of seeing her. That's her in the, in the Delta. And this, this picture actually led to, uh, to us purchasing Folly. So we're coming up, John Perkins, the Perkins brothers, and, and I, we're coming up, we have a tradition for the stag crews of going from here to Tinsley Island. And um, Ted Collins, my partner in, in uh, uh, Folly, was on another boat, and Ted is an avid photographer and had, has a wonderful Leica camera. And he took this shot and searched me out at the stag cruise and said, I've got a money shot of your boat. You've got to see it. And I went and looked at it. And sure enough, uh, I did. And that began a friendship that led to all of us getting together and, uh, and investing in, um, in, in Folly. But I thought it was one of the best pictures ever taken of Miss 102. And that's uh, Folly on the right side and Miss 102 on the left uh, on my dock in Walnut, Walnut Grove. Um, it was about 1960 that things were changing in the boat business and the Stevens were astute enough businessmen that they knew that the region and the Stockton area, which had always advantaged them as boat builders, was changing. And there was more regulation, higher costs, harder to find workers. And so they sold the company to Jack Rather who built the Disneyland Hotel. He was in Ronald Reagan's uh, kitchen cabinet. He had been trying to buy it from him to add it to his, his um, uh, cachet of businesses. And they finally acquiesced and sold it to him. He owned it for three years. And he, um, I think when things were slow, he just ordered a boat. And he, there's about four Lone Rangers. And uh, he's one of the people that owned, owned multiple uh, Stevens, like Ted Bricks uh, and the Amelia Marie's. But there are four Lone Rangers, and uh, this is the largest one. It's now a charter boat on Hudson Bay, 
or, or the Hudson River uh, based in Manhattan. What size is that one? 73, 73 feet. After three years, um, Rather Corporation decided it was not a fit for them and the Stevens family quietly bought, bought the company back. Uh, this is Joie, um, uh, which was Ted Brick's third boat. Uh, my partner Ted Harris and I bought this boat in Southern California. I had been trying to see it for years. I went to the Hagen Museum, looked it up, and every time I made an appointment to go look at the boat, because uh, I knew it was one of the great ones, um, the guy would cancel on me. And I, I didn't know if he was part of the governor's seat secret witness program or what it was, but he would always cancel. Sometimes I'd fly down there and I'd get a call at the airport when I landed, he'd say, I don't have time today, you know. <laughs> so then I get a call from the Hagen Museum. He had called the Hagen. Somebody had bought um, the marina he was in. He'd lived there 28 years. Never fired the engines up on this boat in 28 years. There was 900 gallons of fuel on it. And he had two weeks to get out. Somebody bought it and they didn't want any liverboards. So he was, I think it was a month to get out. So he was under tremendous pressure. I went down and looked at it. It was the only time I ever bought a boat without doing an out of the water survey. Don't, that was the lesson. <laughs> um, but it looked fabulous. He was an antique dealer. We loved the boat, we loved the lines. Uh, keep going, Ted. Um, that, uh, that, that's her right after we took, took possession. Uh, I tried to restore working with people in Southern California. Lay days were $300 a day, and it was during the pandemic. You know, I couldn't couldn't manage it at all or, or oversee it. So I finally did something I didn't have any experience doing, and it actually turned out pretty well. This is one of those experiences in life that you wish you knew at the beginning, which you learn by the end. But we put the boat on a truck and brought it to Stockton. Uh, one of the engines had failed. And uh, then the fun began. This is taking place in Stockton uh, now. Lots of rot, lots of electrolysis. We, re we replaced the, um, the propeller shafts, we replaced, replaced the propellers. Electrolysis had claimed one of the struts. Uh, there's a lot of the, the, the rot, termites, everything that could go wrong. I jokingly say the only thing we saved on this boat was the lines. Um, <laughs> That's the transom restored. She is gonna really be something special when we're done. Um, we got one break in the whole thing. And, and that was, and I, I still can't believe this happened. Some of you knew Gary Clausen at Twin Rivers who passed just recently. But um, Brendan Schmidt, my surveyor, told me, the boat's coming along as you can see. We put a new deck on it and, go ahead Charles. Yeah, that's her prior to restoration at Catalina. I convinced my wife that my daughter was going to school in Southern California, that the, this boat would be great while she was in school down there. And uh, anyway, we got one trip before uh, we put her on a truck and brought her up here. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been, it, you know, it, it's gonna be fine when we're done, but I'll tell you, it, there were just a lot of surprises. Um, back up, uh, Charles. Um, so, you know, what, what we plan on doing is this is 1960, and you can see that the boat's name is Amelia Marie, Ted Brick named it for his wife, who hated boating. And um, <laughs> all of his boats were named Amelia Marie. And somewhere along the line, somebody named it Joie. And, uh, and, and, and so far, we're, we've kept that name. But uh, this was 1960 when they splashed the boat. And the Stockton record did a big story. And we're going to go back to the Stevens Yard when Joie is done. And we're going to recreate this scene. And Donna and Pat and Chris have agreed to help us recreate it. You're all invited. Great. You're all invited. And we're going to uh, rechristen the boat and do a splash party just like they used to at, uh, at, at Stevens. This is Mrs. Brick. Uh, when she couldn't find her husband, I think she uh, broke the bottle of champagne on the front of the boat, which would probably happen to me. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it, it, has been, it has been quite a journey. And, um, uh, you know, this presentation uh, by design is not just about the history of Stevens Brothers. It's about my experience with, uh, 
with Stevens. And I had the, the honor and pleasure of spending a lot of time with Dick Stevens. The Stevens family spent, uh, uh, allowed him to spend time with me and we became, became great friends at, at the time that my father had passed away and he, in a way, became kind of a substitute for my late dad. And we spent a lot of time together and he was our North Star. We didn't do anything without him. And he told me once, he said, I worked with two geniuses in my lifetime. One was Classy Cummins, and the other one was Leo Fender. Leo Fender from Fender Guitar owns six Stevens boats. Wow. And I think Leo and Classy knew that they were working with a genius also. Thank you very much. survey and like history of Stevens Marine. Good heavens. This would hot. Oh, Steve? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Good. So um, each of us have dreams and some of us, the many people who own boats for a long time, dream about boats. Tell me about a Stevens dream. What would be in a Stevens dream if you were to have a dream about Stevens? Is the boat fast? Is the boat beautiful? Are people stopping and saying, who owns that? If you're in a hurry, don't take a boat. <laughs> <laughs> these, were, these were the Learjets of their day. You know, if, you, if you go down the provenance of, of Stevens, I mean, out here there's a boat called Easy Way. Before it was called Easy Way, it was called Lady Smith. Before it was called Lady Smith, it was called Rosalind, a very well-known San Francisco family. The Swigs of Fairmont Hotel fame um, commissioned that boat. And um, uh, in a well-traveled exercise, Dick Swig named the boat Rosalind for his wife, Sissy, who still uh, lives in San Francisco and is in touch with Jonathan Perkins, uh, one of our partners in Folly, who um, owns, the boat, owns the boat today. So, you know, to me, you know, owning a Stevens boat in the 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, you would arrive, basically. You, you go back, you look at the provenance of, of uh, uh, and the registry of Stevens boats. You know, they're families who the streets are named after. They're the, they're the people who developed the commerce and businesses in, in, in San Francisco. They're the philanthropists. Um, uh, you know, Folly, you know, Dick Stevens always told me that Folly was the best boat that they ever built. Um, uh, I think he has told some other people something <laughs> similar about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but Dick didn't design that book. <laughs> Dick's father, Roy, designed that book. And uh, when they christened that boat, uh, they, it was the toughest crowd they'd ever had at Stevens Brothers. They had to bring in security that day. Remember, Johnny Joseph Marino ordered it. Under the AKA Robert K. Tui. And he, uh, Dick Stevens, was 11 years old, and his toy boat was stolen from the, the boat yard all day. And he was still pissed off about it. <laughs> and, uh, he told me that story. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, there's just, there's just a, a romance, there's a, a history with all these things. You go back and look at them, at the incredible people that owned them and their stories. And, and, and to me, that's what's so enjoyable. And <clears throat> look, it was Trumpy on the East Coast and it was Stevens on the West Coast. And, and arguably, Trumpy may have been a better built boat, but they didn't have the panache, the lines, the charisma that a Stevens does on the water. When you see a Stevens on the water, it pops. It's like a Reba. <clears throat> so as a little boy in this club um, in the uh, 60s, Dolger used to keep Westlake right out here in front. She was one of the boats that bowed into the dock at a diagonal berth. And uh, it was a party machine. It was one long party all through the weekend. And as a young, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old kid running around the docks, uh, I, we were always honored when we could be asked on the boat. And he wasn't a sailor. He couldn't sail. He could never sail his way out of a, out of a harbor, but he could basically sell houses like nobody's business. Westlake, the entire Westlake was built by Dolger, and uh, that's a long heritage that this club has. The Sunset District was built by a guy named Marty Russo, 
and he was a yachtsman in St. Francis Yachtsman. And big pieces of Castro Valley and Hayward were built by Denny Jordan, who was the only three-term commodore of this yacht club. So there's a long association between entrepreneurs in the Bay Area and yachting, and many of them had Stevens yachts. They were the prestige ride for a person to have. So, and the Stevens, there's a museum. If you go up to the Aggie Museum, Rusty, how much time have you spent in the museum? A lot of time. I mean, that's our, that's, that's our resources. You know, we go there, you make an appointment, and they come out there with the white gloves, they pull a file, and it's fascinating, uh, you know, to, to go back and every little dispute, uh, you know, there's, a, there's communication between the owner and, you know, payments and design features and all, all kinds of things. Uh, there, was a, there were letters written by uh, the new owner of Westlake as he was going through the, uh, the um, uh, Panama Canal, um, and she spent a lot of time in the, in, in the Caribbean. Um, I, I want to thank George Olson because George is, is one of the people that, that uh, like you, Ron, he knew a lot of these people. And uh, I spent a lot of time with, with, with George picking his brain because, uh, you know, I read about him, I research him, but I didn't know him. George and Ron knew a lot of these people. Some of the rest of you in this room knew or became acquainted with uh, or interacted with, with, with some of these people. And, and, and they were characters, like a lot of really successful people. You know, they were, they, they were characters, and this is how they, they choose to spend their time. And, and they respected the, the artistry of, of, of Stevens. So if anyone, anyone has a question, raise a hand. We'll give you the mic and uh, entertain your question. Uh, so there's been a lot of work lately on, in the Delta, uh, woodworking, Rusty. Talk a little bit about this growing trend. It's not expensive, but it's quite good quality. We saw Jaw up there. What about the budding little business of woodworking and boat working in the Delta, the Calvary Delta? Yeah, there, there seems to be a bit of a renaissance, although like in all industries, it's really hard to find people. It's gotten, it's gotten expensive. Actually, a, a, a lot of the um, uh, Hispanic workers uh, that, that learned at Stevens Brothers and a lot of the other um, haul out spots, boat yards, are the ones that have taken up, taken up the crack. Uh, Jose Montano has worked on all three of, 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 of my boats, and you know, I, I, I couldn't, couldn't do it without him. I don't think there's nearly the vitality that there is in Port Townsend and places like that up in Washington, right. but hopefully it'll enjoy some kind of a, a, a renaissance. Now we showed a picture, you had an illustration, a photo of your boat being taken across land. 56 foot boat. Talk a little, tell people what the game was like when you've got to move a 56 foot quote wide load across land. What's that all about? The permits and so on. You know, it, 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 I, I used a company called Associated and other than the amount of time it took me to, to, to get them to pick the boat up and deliver it, they were fascinating. I mean, they would call me and they'd say, well, you know, so it's 334 miles from where the boat was in Southern California, middle of the pandemic. You know, I, I was afraid to get on an airplane to go down there the damn if I was going to drive to check on things. Uh, lay days down there are five, six times what they are up here. So um, they call me and they say, well, 1,700 miles. We had to go, I don't know, somewhere halfway to Connecticut. <laughs> because there's all these overpasses right. that, that, that they can't get under. And, I worked with them and worked with them and I, I'd been on the transportation committee and still had contacts at Caltrans when I was in the legislature. And so I brought, I, I called on those contacts. Finally, we got down to about 434 miles from the original estimate of 1,700. They, they spent six miles on I-5. And if you go back to that picture, it's I mean, it's a goat trail on a mountain. <laughs> and I'll tell you, if any of you are ever thinking about getting into some illicit business, find one of those truck drivers or their pilot guys because they ain't got back roads and ways to So you know, it was it was a fascinating kind of a kind of an experience, and it worked out it worked out really really well um, for for us. And you know, it's it's 25 30 miles from. Uh, from my home, so I'm ever able to go there regularly, and I have my people working on it. I mean, I, I can't even imagine what it would have happened and what it would have would have cost if I kept trying to do it uh, as an absentee owner. Um, and and I will tell you, the, the, the best way to buy these boats is 
find someone who loved it like I do, like I do, who takes good care of them, and and um, uh, and, and and then buy it from the family when they when he checks out. That's the best way <laughs> to buy one of these boats. Now you're gonna have to deal with his wife, who he's blown a lot of smoke up her skirt about what that boat was worth. <laughs> Years, but eventually you'll get it. Eventually you'll get it. That was the experience with that was the experience with uh, with with folly. And I, I think we went from seven hundred thousand to less than two over a long period of time. Uh, but we finally finally got the boat. Uh, and uh, you know, find you know, my rule for owners is that nobody's trying to figure out who put the last gallon of diesel in the boat. And if you're with them on the boat. That, uh, that you enjoy each other. And so far, I've been successful in all my partnerships. Uh, Ted Harris is my partner in this boat, and he's my business partner. He has been stellar. <coughs> he never signed up for what we've had to deal with to get this boat done. <laughs> but a funny story I was going to tell. So I mentioned Gary Clausen, now the late Gary Clausen. But one of the motors on the boat failed. And you know, I thought maybe the captain would run it without oil. I didn't know what. There were all kinds of, of uh, scenarios. But when they broke, broke the boat down, they found a defective valve. And so I called Brendan Schmidt, Schmidt my, my surveyor, and he said, you know, you may have an insurance claim. I said, how the hell can I have an insurance claim on an engine that's 60 years old? <laughs> <laughs> or a, a warranty claim. <laughs> so we put in the claim. Gary Clausen from Twin Rivers helped me do that. Um, we got a rejection, um, and we filed an appeal. And the company brought in metallurgists and all kinds of other people to to look at it. And we had a meeting down there, and Gary said, "Go call Orvis Stacy. He is the guru of Detroit diesels on the West Coast. Some of you may know Orvis, but Orvis had." three shops, and he loved Detroit diesels. He knew more about them than anybody. He was 92 years old. I drove up to Copperopolis, picked him up, brought him down. He takes one look at it, and he says, it's a latent defect. This is a factory defect on a 62-year-old valve. <laughs> and the suits from the insurance company, the metallurgists were all there. They all knew of Stacy's reputation. They all said, yeah, Stacy's right, I guess. <laughs> so we ended up with a $71,000 claim, which went a long way. I mean, I still can't believe that. Orvis died two weeks later. <laughs> and then Gary Clausen tragically passed away also, and I, uh, I am in Orvis' debt and Gary's forever. But that was the one break we got on the restoration of this boat. I plan to bring it here when we're done, of course, you're all going to be at the christening, but um, I plan to bring it here 30 or so hours, shake out, and we're going to take it to Southern California on its own bottom, and uh, uh, it'll it'll be somewhere in Southern California. We're going to use it to, uh, to take our families to um, and friends to uh, Catalina. That's that's kind of the idea. Right here. So, rest of the areas start with uh, Brilliant Brothers in the Delta. Add a lot of speed, incredible technology, wonderful craftsmanship, and 80 years of love. Thank you for bringing us the story of Stevens Marine. Thank you. Can you indulge me for, for just a minute? I, I've gotten great joy. You know, we've all heard that little saying. Uh, painful saying at times like there's two happy days in a boat owner's life. You've all heard that. Well, you know, I disagree with it. I have had great joy in dealing with these boats. There have been some painful, painful days, and you saw pictures of some of them. But um, uh, I want to acknowledge the Stevens family and and thank them. Bravo! 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 Thank you. And the joy that you and your family and 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 your essential workers. Uh, have, have brought to so many of us in this room. Thank you. Thank you all. More and, more. and with that, we adjourn the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you, everyone.
smile here. Okay, smile, kids. Here. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs>